Adam Russo is in the house. Hello, everybody. And you live in a log cabin. Yes, I do. Would you like to see a little bit of it? Wow, yes. And you built it yourself. Well, with very good help, put it that way, but not many of us. <laughs> wow. There it is. The loft, ladder, kitchen. There's another kind of porch area over there. There's wood stove, which is really hot right now. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's all the logs. Uh, we cut them right here on the property. Well, I mean, it's mostly a solo project for the most part, but I cut them on the property here and uh, started just started peeling them. And then I got people to help me. And then four years later, here we are. I can sit in it and I'm actually pretty warm, believe it or not. There's no mice. <laughs> so you, know, you knew this isolation was going to happen, is what you're saying. I knew it was going to happen the first tree I cut. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had no idea, but I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and yeah, and I'm the type of person that thrives on a little bit of isolation. So this is, this is great for me. So, like, Cheers, say that. <laughs> All right. well, yes, it is a whiskey fireside chat. So it is. Yes. I, um, and I tell I you, do, I, have, I have a sweet tooth. I have a sweet tooth. So I'm mean, I having Bailey's. It's a bit good. of a cheat, but very good. I had two choices. I'm running low. <laughs> good lord! I either got some of the cheap stuff that's kind of. Oh wow! I, I mean, it's good cheap stuff on on ice. And I got <laughs> this stuff. I had to blow the dust off. I, I got this six years ago. In oh Southern Ontario by Sandbanks or something like that. Um, it's mixed with with um, maple syrup, and it's not good. So let's just go for the cheap stuff. Okay, <laughs> that's why that's it's why it's still there. <laughs> that's why it's been on the uh, on the shelf for for six years. <laughs> My lord, uh, yeah, and you're right on the border of Algonquin Park. I am. Yeah, uh, right in the Whitney side. Yeah, um, I'm closer to town than I am. Uh, the absolute wilderness, but I mean, Algonquin's five minutes away, and yeah, so it's it's nice and quiet out here. Yeah, and I, I'm not yeah. supposed to. Uh, I was supposed to speak at the your library in a couple of weeks, and I, you know everything's oh. been canceled. So, well, I, that might happen in a couple of weeks, but yeah, I um, yeah, the whole tour got canceled. But yeah, I, I was really excited about about that part of the the journey. So, ah, uh, too bad, too yeah. bad. Okay. Well, we will miss you over here. Isn't that I would, I, <laughs> Adam, you've always been made me cry. Stay, you, would, <laughs> you could have stayed in my cabin and everything. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I would have stayed in a tent. <laughs> well, I, I, no, I, I could go off and tell everybody I, 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 I isolated with a famous musician. All right, I got a script. I, I haven't kept a script oh. this entire time uh, whatsoever, but I, I do have some things written down. Oh, my Lord. This is going to kill me. These whiskey chats every day. Like, it's, oh, my look. I mean, today, actually, I was, uh, who was I interviewing with today? And I got to say, there was tea in the cup. There was no whiskey. I faked it. <laughs> <laughs> How can we be so sure you're telling the truth, Kevin? I don't no, know. no, you got, you got to fake it. I'm telling you. All right. Uh, all right. First question. Are you ready? Um, who, what, where got you into wilderness travel or wilderness experiences? Well, uh, growing up in southern Ontario, uh, we had a family cottage um, near Bancroft. So, you know, jumping in the lakes there and canoeing around there as a kid and fishing and stuff like that was uh, the, like, starting point of it all. And our aunt and uncle would take us camping. Often as kids, we'd go to Presqu'ila a lot, actually, randomly. And uh, we'd just like the smaller parks like Balsam Lake and stuff like that. So we went camping as kids, and we always loved it. And uh, then it wasn't until I was like in my early 20s that I actually started doing backcountry travel. And uh, believe it or not, this might sound cliche, but I picked up, I was really interested in the whole uh, like climate change thing at the time. So I picked up a David Suzuki book and he speaks so eloquently about like experiences in nature and nature connection and all that stuff that it just like inspired me like crazy. So I spent the whole year saving up and buying piece of gear after gear and then I did my first trip in uh, Algonquin here um, on the Western Uplands Trail.
a little solo trip and it just kept going from there so yeah that's fantastic so well actually think about it though your first album was it was all music it wasn't lyrics and you <laughs> actually wrote about that trail was that all, during that time no it wouldn't be that during that time but um let's see now that was all kind of a culmination of uh a couple different trips mostly one big trip i did i did a big like 14 day trip in there once uh like a solo trip which is kind of wild But uh, a lot of those tunes came from that. But then, yeah, there was also a section on there of the Western Uplands sketches. Yeah, and that was all based on my, I did quite a few trips on the Western Uplands trail. And uh, yeah, you know, th there's a lot to be said, like when you're writing tunes or music or uh, literature, or poetry, or whatever, a lot of it happens, like for me anyways, it, it settles in a little bit after and then I can I think back and then I can write about it. But when I, usually if I'm right in it, I can't write anything. So the ideas came from those scripts, and I wrote about it a little later. That's how it usually yeah. seems to go. Yeah. What made you, like, I, you have a music background. I, in fact, if, thinking back, you actually went to school for music, didn't you? Yeah, don't remind me. No. <laughs> yeah, you did, you did. <laughs> okay, okay. Just kidding. What do you but mean? Yes, I did. Uh, I went, uh, so uh, I went through the ringer with, like, classical guitar, which actually I loved it at the time. Like, um, I did, uh, uh, high school like everybody else and then I went into university and I went into I got into U of T for classical guitar performance because you can actually take that which is basically you know a way to play guitar all through university and get, and get a degree at the same time which is great uh, but I took it really seriously and I, I got a master's degree as well in classical guitar and uh, I also won like the national classical guitar competition like first place back in the day like 10 years ago and uh, that's all like Bach and all that kind of repertoire from Europe and South America and all that um, so I went through the ringer with that and I, I loved it, you know, but, uh, I found playing repertoire from like 1785 Germany wasn't really relevant to, you know, 21st century Canada. And then I kind of got out of that purist world a little bit. It was kind of like a purist classical musicians world that I was in. And I stepped away from that. I, I took what I needed and I, I still enjoy classical music and all that, but I'm not heavily involved in it as I was. But uh, I took my, you know, training from that and wrote my own instrumental music dedicated to Algonquin Park, which was my first album. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, that's where that came about. Yeah. do that did you, did you all of a sudden wake up one morning and say i'm going to write an album what was it called gonquin park sketches and it was all instrumental. Uh -huh. yeah and uh it's just like yeah that's what i'm going to do or was it something that was always gnawing at you uh deep down inside to do well and i wonder if you can relate to this too but uh i had this um whenever i'm out there it's usually a very moving experience to see like giant old white pines and big old boulders and untouched lakes and like the untouched geography of home and it just uh when you're so moved by it it just gives you this very specific feeling of inspiration so like i just i'm super inspired when i'm out there and then i just i'm so inspired that i have to do something about it and then uh so, so that's kind of where it comes from just from being inspired by being out in those areas and uh yeah it's like you can't I, you know being an artistic person i just can't help but like express it somehow um and then a little deeper than that too, like I've kind of dedicated 
a lot of my musical stuff strictly to Canadian content because we don't have a lot of it and um, we don't really appreciate our own backyard very much. So I'm trying to like open people's eyes to that a little bit, you know, um, and I could go off into the deep end on this topic if you want, <laughs> but that's the long story short. <laughs> Well, we're, we're we're in a pandemic, so but uh, the <laughs> nobody's going anywhere, Adam. Uh, the one song on that album, "Path of the Paddle," I think, right? Yeah, yeah. I, can you randomly just play it? Um, I will. I can play a bit of it. Sure. Let's see if I can see me here. It, it's um, good. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I can play a bit of it. It's a very long one. Um, it's See, when you're living in a cabin and you're doing a lot of outdoor work, your nails are always broken. So my nails sound really bad right now. Oh, these artists, they're thought, always oh, complaining oh. about their nails. Oh, my yeah. blah, blah, blah. I know. <laughs> uh, but I'll play the intro, maybe a little bit of that tune. Yeah, so... Guitars don't like wood stoves very much. It's hard to tune guitars around wood stoves. All right. Yes. Yeah, so, path of the paddle. Path, path of the paddle. This tune um, I wrote quite a few years ago now, and I tried to convey the feeling and the journey of a canoe trip uh, in this piece of music. And it was it's it's about six minutes long, and something like that. And it's all instrumental guitar. Um, and yeah, I you know I just tried to capture the the solitude of it, the craziness of it, um, and that feeling. The cool thing about instrumental music, as we were talking about, is that there are no words, so it's wide open. Uh, it's not telling you what to think. So it's that's the cool thing about instrumental music. Uh, it gives uh, it gives life to that which you can't really express in words. It's another thing too. So words words always fall short if we're trying to explain waking up at six a.m. and being in the middle of a lake in backcountry Ontario somewhere. Can't really explain that in words, so music usually fills the void. But anyway, all that being said, I'll play a bit of this tune. So, Path of the Paddle, here we go. <laughs> that's great it's great it's just really hilarious this whole uh, isolation at home like my dog's with me 
And all of a sudden, just when you're starting to play this beautiful music, the dog's like, I like to play with my rabbit. Can I play with my rabbit? And it, go on, go on, go on. We're, we're, we're listening to Adam Russo. You didn't like my song, geez. What, what a well, jerk. <laughs> well, I, think, I think the dog's all excited. So what, what did make you uh, all of a sudden change? Well, I don't know. What, what did you write before? Like you didn't do any albums about wilderness before or, or anything, right? You just all of a sudden started doing it. Uh, yeah. That's it. Yeah, it's funny how that happens, eh? Um, uh, yeah, before that, I was, I was like a lot of other musicians. Like during school, I had a lot of bar. I was playing in, uh, I, I did music at, at school in Toronto. So I, I had this wicked gig at the Royal York Hotel for six years or seven years. Wow. Every weekend. I started there when I was 19. So I was playing Sweet Caroline and Don't Stop Believing" and Piano Man and all the songs, right? I was mostly doing covers and like learning a bunch of classical music pieces. That was like my life for a long time. Um, but when it came time for me to like actually want to write my own stuff, uh, the most, like most people write, write love songs and things like that, which are great. But uh, yeah, honestly, the thing that moved me the most was that feeling I got being out in the back country. So I decided that that's what I was going to write about. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and all, then all of a sudden, though, Adam, you started singing. Like, your next album, you were singing. Like, that kind of it didn't floor me. It was like, I really liked your first album. It was really great, very, very relaxing, very, um, you know, lo lots, lots of talent. All of a sudden, oh, my Lord, he's singing. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, who is this person? Once they fall, they'll not be found. He doesn't give you. <laughs> did, you, did you did you actually have to sing to sort of get more in what what was going on? Would, would were people saying, "Well, you're not ever going to make it just by creating albums just with music"? Oh my God! Yeah, all the time. Uh, I remember playing at uh, the the Royal York all the time, and people were like, "Cause I for a long for a lot of those years, I just played instrumental while people were kind of drinking and stuff, and then all kinds of people, why don't you sing? Why don't you sing?" And then I finally I was like, "Yeah, you know, maybe I should." I should get into singing a bit. And then I started singing and then I started to really like it. And uh, I mean, I'm no purist by any means with instrumental music or anything, but like I've always loved music where there's words. <laughs> so I've always loved all kinds of music. So yeah, I started singing. Uh, after that, I pretty much put out three albums of me singing and playing. And uh, um, yeah, it, it was, it's a totally different thing because now there's a lot more of a story that people can grip onto. Whereas my first CD, I guess you can call it, was, was pretty artsy. And it's not as accessible to the average uh, listener. Um, so it's nice, like, it's nice if you can bridge those gaps as an artist, if you can, like, do something that's really got a lot of artistic integrity that can actually reach the average person. Uh, if you can meld those two things, that's great. So I've kind of got that in mind moving forward. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what happened there. <laughs> well, so, so you, the, the, the second album was Northwest. <clears throat> Yep. Right? Yeah, it was right. It was, yeah. And really good, good album. So, yeah. <laughs> and did all of a sudden people listen to your stuff more at that point because you, you, because I, I remember I, I actually knew you before you started singing, and you had a good crowd at at Algonquin. Like there was a a lot of people loved your music, and then you created Northwest, and I'm thinking, okay, well, is, is he going to uh, change over? And then I listened to it. It's like, no, this is really good. Like I, um, well, actually, just. Can you play something from Northwest so people know what we're talking about? Sure, yeah. Uh, Northwest, so yeah, I, I um, when I was in my 20s, I traveled uh, up to the Northwest Territories. And I worked at a bush lodge out there, but along the way I stopped and I did like work exchanges. I stopped in Saskatchewan and I stopped in like BC in the mountains and I stopped in Whitehorse and ended up in the Northwest Territories for like the whole winter, which was awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, Anyways, yeah, like I, I wrote songs about those places. So here's a little, here's a little snippet. Um, 
not so much about the wilderness side of things, but it's about life in Whitehorse, um, which is, you know, there's the wilderness stuff that I like to write about. And there's also like the stories of the people too. So I try to capture kind of a, a night in Whitehorse, a typical night. Uh, their main beverage up there is Yukon Gold. Oh, I love uh, this song. This yeah. Is song. <laughs> I, have a, I have it written down right here. <laughs> oh, you got all the words. You going to sing with me? Or? <laughs> oh, I was, I was going to say, ask Adam to uh, end with Yukon Gold, but we're mm. not ending it with Yukon Gold because you're playing it now. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> um, yeah, so Yukon Gold. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Yukon Gold's the main drink in, in Whitehorse, and it's a great it's a great town. Like, it's a total winter town if you're there in, in the wintertime. Like, there's Christmas lights everywhere, and people are wonderfully friendly, and uh, it's just a great place. So, um, I'll play the chorus of that song. Maybe uh, a little part of it, anyways. This little part of the song, I talk about meeting this guy Dan, who actually gave me a job when I was there, and I worked on him or worked with him on a Parks Canada monument, uh, the old paddle wheeler that's on the Yukon River, and we put a new floor in. So I met him there, just had an open mic, and he just gave me a job on the spot, which is kind of fun. So, uh, and he was obsessed with the War of 1812 for some reason. I don't know why, but anyways. Oh, sitting on my own at the open mic. Dan calls me over to have a pint Didn't do the stories I soon did tell He went on and on and on About the war of 1812 And his stories never got old Pint of Yukon Gold And his warm heart doesn't mind the cold, never want to be so upset. Just a little snippet. I guess I'll start playing like full songs for you as we go. I guess. <laughs> But there's a little, well, there's a little piece, yeah. <laughs> it's good, it's good, you, you know, because well, when I'm listening to that, it's almost like a, it's like a Stan Rogers tune, and I know I watching your YouTube. That's a huge but, compliment, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's because really, I think maybe that's what, what um, I watched a lot of your stuff on YouTube, and you, you actually play a lot of Stan Rogers, especially now, right now, you're doing a, a whole series of songs almost every night, and uh, yeah. it's not even in the script, but you got a Stan Rogers in you right now. Do you want to? Just do a, a couple of chords of Stan Rogers? You just struck a chord there, Kevin, yes. Uh, Stan Rogers, for the record, was, I'd say, like, the greatest Canadian songwriter ever and singer. Um, and he, I only actually recently discovered for myself Stan Rogers, like, two years ago. I didn't know anything about Stan. I had no idea about Stan, like, after all my albums were recorded. I didn't even know who he was. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You went to the University of what? <laughs> exactly yeah different world kevin different worlds wow yeah and in university okay i'll just to give you a little university we played like you know um this is a very cliche thing but uh, I was played pretty badly, but anyways, you get the idea. Different world. <laughs> uh, but when I used to play at the Royal York Hotel, people would be like, you know any Stan Rogers? And I only remember this in hindsight, looking back. At the time, it meant nothing to me because every, everybody thought they were an expert. Oh, you should learn this song. Oh, you should learn this song. You should learn this song. And after a while, it just sounded like noise. But people used to mention him, and at the time, it meant nothing to me. And only it was literally, and I, I hate to admit this. I'm like ashamed to admit it, but in 2018, I first was like, oh, who's this Stan Rogers guy? And needless to say, that's changed everything for me. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, he, he's, uh, yeah, I could talk forever about Stan Rogers, but he really told the story of the people in a way that nobody ever did. 
And he basically took the working person and turned them into a hero in all of his songs. And a lot of his songs had to do with the sea and working close to the land. And he did it better than anybody. So, but do I have Stan Rogers in me? Yes. What would you like to hear? <laughs> do you have choice. any faith? Your choice. Um, uh, let's see. Sure. Um, do you know the Mary Ellen Carter? That song? Mm. Yeah? I'll play a bit of that one, sure. Um, or even uh, The Idiot. Do you know The Idiot? That's a good one, too. There's so many good ones. It's actually, it's very pressing right now, this tune, because uh, it talks about how people from the East move West for work. Um, oh, yeah. And they all leave their, their homeland. And now, now, oddly enough, everybody at West is at work, and a lot of them are from the East. So uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a uh, timely one. Um, so, yeah, I'll play a bit of that one for you. Sure, it's... I often take these night shift walks from the floor and thought around. I turn my back on the tools and stacks and make for open ground. Far out beyond the tank bar and fence where the gas flare makes no sound. I'll forget the stink and I always think back to that eastern town. I remember back six years ago, this western life I chose. Every day the news would say some factories going through coal. Well, I could have stayed to take the toll, but I'm not one of those. Take nothing free, and that makes me an idiot, I suppose. So, bid farewell to the eastern town I never more will see. Work I must, so I eat this dust and breathe refinery. Oh, I miss the green and the woods and streams, and I don't like cowboy clothes. But I like being free, and that makes me an idiot, I suppose. Yeah, that's great. Did. That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. See, that, Good song. Is that, um, so you, you, you've gone from, well, first of all, you lived in a, I, I wanted to ask you about living in that shelter for almost a year. I, I think that's a different story, but basically you build a cabin and then you went out to Newfoundland. And is that yeah. just a, a musical thing that you wanted to do? It's like for your art or? Yeah. Um, so uh, quite a few years back now, like I think in 2013, 2014, that's when I went out west and up north and I got to know the country that way. Uh, and then only like last spring, so just over a year ago, I went to Newfoundland for the first time because I'd never been. And I'd always loved the music from there. And uh, I just had to go experience it. And well, <laughs> I liked it so much, I spent the better part of a year out there and I just got back. So, um, and I played all downtown St. John's, you know, all over the place. And it was great. <laughs> like, and Newfoundlanders are awesome people. And like some of the best musicians I've ever seen. Like I've never seen anything like it for the size of the place. There's only what, 500,000 people or so in Newfoundland. Uh, and the quality of the musicians there is world-class everywhere you go. It's just unbelievable. I've never, I've, I've never seen anything like it. And it's amazing being around that. And I learned so much from those people. Uh, and, you know, I learned their songs and there's so many songs because I mean, you know, settler history has been there for over 500 years. Uh, and so there's, and they've been writing songs the whole time. So there's lots of good songs. Yeah. yeah so did you, did you come back with another album? Because what, so going over your albums, you had Algonquin Park Sketches, you had Northwest, you had Cavan Speaks. And then you, the latest one is Frozen In, which is a winter one. And so I saw that you went out, uh, uh, you know, uh, or to the East Coast and, uh, and you were in that winter storm. The big <laughs> yeah. Oh my Lord. That's a great this time. Is my, this is my second lockdown right now. It's the second state of emergency right now. Because yeah, in, in January, we got nailed with about 70 to 90 centimeters in one dumping. Oh my and the whole town, all of St. John's was completely shut down. We were walking down the street and all that was showing of cars was a little piece of the side view mirror sticking out. That's it. 
it snows up past the first first story of the houses. It's just crazy. <laughs> Because I'm thinking that you basically go uh, uh, live experiences to create music, or maybe you create music to go on experiences. I'm not sure one or the other. Ah, yeah, like, uh, well, that's a good question. Was up with the dawning and down to the stage and haul on your oil. your nine foot oars across her and leave the land behind head her out through the fog on the sand it's kind of so it's not like a lot of people look at what i'm doing and they think i'm on some kind of crazy joyride but i actually take it really seriously i i'm really interested in uh, the stories of the people and the culture around Canada, because traditionally Canada's a colony and we kind of suffer for an identity. Uh, we were traditionally a colony of England. Well, there's the whole native culture, which has been here for thousands of years. And of course we all know that story goes, but in, in, in recent centuries, uh, you know, we were colonized by England and we had this kind of pseudo English culture here. And then, you know, the French were also here. And then now we're kind of like this colony of America and, in a lot of places where we just we buy american stuff we watch american movies there are american franchises everywhere we mer wear american brand names so we're kind of like a colony of america now so i kind of found it was my duty artistically to actually represent the place where i was from there's no not the place that's on TV or whatever. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's, so me traveling around was really getting, getting perspective on who lives out in Canada land <laughs> and, uh, um, and what are the stories out there uh, and what's it like here? Because, um, you know, a lot of the pop culture is, you know, I hate to say it, but it's, it's very influenced by America and, I think we're, we have more to offer than just copying another country. Nothing wrong with America, but you know, <laughs> yeah. So I, I go around to actually absorb, download the information of the places and then try and portray it as best I can with the ultimate goal now, which is similar to what Stan Rogers was doing. Speaking of Stan, um, which is to, you know, create songs that are of the people and uh, that represent the whole country. Um, so the East Coast I hadn't really been to, and I really wanted to go out and kind of dig dig in there and see what it was all about and learn that music. And uh, um, so I did that. That's why I went out there. And I ended up really loving it. So I I don't know where I'm going to go next, <laughs> but I'm here for now. So <laughs> did, did you rush back and, and create more songs because of that experience? My radio just turned on. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm back. My radio just turned on randomly. That was weird. <laughs> Sorry, what'd you say, Kevin? <laughs> um, <laughs> it, yeah. it, it, his cabin is haunted as well. <laughs> when, when I want the radio to work, it doesn't work. When I don't want it to work, it works. So, yeah. You know I mean, the really you know. crazy thing, though, is your, your radio went randomly on, but what was the only thing we heard is the Kona uh, 19. Yeah, are you I mean, surprised? It's, it's <laughs> right? It's everywhere. Yeah. Wow, that is, wow. Wow, there's there's an album in that. Um, I forgot the question. Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, did you come back from the the East Coast with all these songs in your head, and you are you working on something now? Or, um, yeah, so I, I've got a bunch of uh, original stuff in the works, uh, kind of about Newfoundland, and uh, what I found myself doing mostly there was learning their songs that they that you hear everywhere there, because the songs you hear in Newfoundland are not the songs you hear on the mainland of Canada. When you're in Newfoundland, Newfoundland is basically its own country. Uh, I mean, it was its own country until what, 1949, I believe? 
and that feeling is still there like it's it's an island removed from the rest of everything else and there's a very distinct culture and when they when they wanted to join Canada it was like a 50 50 vote <laughs> so it's really its own thing and they have their own tunes over there that nobody knows out on the mainland uh, the closest thing you can get to of course is great big C but it's funny in St. John's, you never hear a word about Great Big C. <laughs> really? Yeah, I swear. Uh, like, everyone knows who they are, and everyone knows Alan Doyle. I, I've seen him around downtown, and uh, but he's not really part of the local music scene there at all, from what, I, from what I saw. Maybe I'm wrong, but I was out all the time, and I didn't really see him. He's more of the guy that represents Newfoundland on the mainland. He's kind of their, like, P PR guy, <laughs> or whatever you call him, <laughs> but uh, uh, he's great. Um, but anyways, yeah, there's a lot of songs over there that I'd never heard before, and they're great because they really, um, like Stan Rogers did, they really captured the soul of the place and what the people were all about and what they've done and where they're from and all that kind of stuff. So I couldn't help but just learn a bunch of songs from over there first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's an amazing place. I, I've been there a few times, and I go back there in a dime. Yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, so you, you basically have a cabin beside Algonquin and you worked as a maintenance person. In fact, I think you're wearing the shirt, are you? Well, this is, uh, this is the old shirt here. Let me get my, here. This is when it was called Ontario Lands and Forests. See? Oh my Lord, that's an old shirt. Where, where, what it is. thrift store did you get that from? Um, that's a big secret where I got this shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah it is uh from the 60s i believe that when it before it was called ministry of natural resources yeah <laughs> wow yeah so but uh yeah i worked as a maintenance guy like uh well actually as a warden i worked as a warden in the park um uh when you live in whitney and you're doing work around here you get to know people and then i kind of got into the park system and uh i did that for a summer and it was great like it was i worked on the west side of the park and i, I mean yeah it is like the best job ever because you're paddling all the time you're constantly talking to people that love the park and you're out on every campsite you know the work you do is pretty um you know there's nothing special about it you're, you're chainsawing up trees and you're cleaning up garbage from campsites things like that and and dig in uh thunder box holes <laughs> which is my favorite part not um but yeah so you're doing like basic work but uh the surroundings were amazing and getting to know the area like after a while you don't even need the map you're just in there and you know you just know where to go you know every turn of the lake after a while right <laughs> yeah um and i actually might have another one of those jobs this summer coming up for myself uh in a different park uh, i don't know if i'm allowed to say but i'll just say in a different park way far north um and ontario parks is shut down right now so i don't know if i'm going to be able to work so that's up in the air. But I've been in the gig economy playing gigs for almost two years solid again. I kind of go in and out of regular jobs. And I think it's time for me to uh, get a bit of a regular work stint going again. <laughs> uh, okay. yeah. when, you were, when you were working as a, as a warden at, uh, in Algonquin, did you create songs during that as well? I mean, you think about it, I'd buy that. Right. Um, yeah, that actually, I wrote uh, a few off of Frozen up there. Oddly enough, ideas came to me up there and I wrote them down and they all come together. I'm the type of person, again, like things percolate later. So like, for example, my experience as a warden and then my time in Newfoundland um, is kind of turning into this other original song now, uh, which is just like a sea shanty type, type song, which is more like a lake shanty or a pond shanty. <laughs> Um, about being a ranger, you know, in the woods. So I'm working on that. Um, but a lot of things happen after the fact. Like I find when you're right in something, you, it doesn't hit you the same way. You feel inspired to, to do things. But when you're looking back, it's like uh, there's something, it makes it a little bit easier to write about. So um, that's still very much in my mind. To do, like I have a lot of plans, put it that way. <laughs> Lots of plans um, up here. <laughs> When you wrote Shimmering Lights, uh, can you explain that that song? Oh, Shimmering Nights, yeah. Shimmering Nights. Uh, yeah, that um, came from uh, the culmination of many a night being out in 
minus 40, minus 30, minus 20, you know, those cold winter nights when the sky is totally, totally clear, the trees are totally still, the stars are out, and the snow is really bright from, you know, the moonlight. Like, I've had those nights in the far north, like in Northwest Territories. I've had them here in Algonquin. I've had them at my cabin. I've had them all over the place. And it's basically, it's, a, it's my ode to the land and ode to winter time, that song. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's come from quite a few different experiences. Uh, standing outside and, and seeing my breath float up to the night sky in, in January. <laughs> can you play a bit of that? Yeah, sure. Sure I can. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I tried to make the guitar sound really icy on this one. So really like shimmery. <laughs> Shimmering nights, trees like eyes, emeralds white on white. Pale moonlight fades at a sight, stars roll on by. The heart of winter, the dark winter, quiver and smile, full of heart, feel the heat for a while. Keep it at bay, try as you may, this cold comes back to stay. The heart of winter, the star of winter. That's fantastic. A treat to that. Yeah, thanks. Do you still uh, play at the Mad Musher? They're closed right now. <laughs> That's true. But, That's, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I not recently. Um, this last year, I've been mostly in Newfoundland, playing out there, uh, all over the place. So um, I haven't played at the Musher very much. The last time I played there, I think, was about a year ago. Okay. Yeah, and that's here in that's in Whitney on the east side of the park. Yeah. Yeah, I, I the last time I saw you there, you're playing a uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Nothing really matters Anyone can see Nothing really matters Nothing really matters To me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cute. Our waitress just left. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is a crowd favorite to this day. I, yeah, if I'm ever playing somewhere and I if I pull that one out, uh, if everybody's hated every song I played before that, they'll at least like that one. Yeah. <laughs> one of those things. Sorry. 
Well, playing in so many places like bars or, or festivals or whatever, um, is there a frustration where you, you really want everybody to listen to your work and but they want you to play Bohemian Rap City? Oh, Kevin, yeah, this is a very timely call, isn't it? Well, um, yeah, story of my life. Um, but I mean, I get that when you're playing at a place, like I'm on the receiving end of that. Like if I go somewhere, sometimes I just want to hear a song I know and like, you know, I don't want to hear somebody's original stuff all the time so for a very long time to make a living i've been that guy playing like being like what song you want to hear james taylor okay what song you want to hear wagon wheel all right what song you want to hear like i've been that guy for a long time and uh that is entertainment and that's great um but really what i'm interested in is uh art and entertainment too but i'm more interested in creating things and uh you know I'm in the art, into the artistic side of music as opposed to like the big, the big show. Um, I love putting on a show and everything, but I mean, uh, it's there's got to be a lot more behind it than just like, like the flashing lights entertainment side, uh, or or just playing piano man, you know, or playing brown eyed girl, right? Uh, so yeah, if I'm playing at places, the thing is with covers that I've learned is you can never know every cover, so. I can know 500 songs and there's going to be someone in the room. It's like, Oh, don't you know this song? Oh no, sorry. I don't. And then like, Oh, and then they get all disappointed. You can't please everybody. Um, but uh, I've had a blast playing covers, but I think I'm at a point now where uh, I strictly am just going to be focusing on songs that I want to play and record, which have to do with telling the story of the land and people and, and the sea in Canada. Um, and my own tunes that do the same thing. Uh, and I'm going to start easing off a bit on the whole, like, you know, trying to learn every song ever <laughs> to play for a bar. It's been a fun ride with that, but uh, I'm trying to, yeah, slowly get out of that scene a little bit now. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, obviously you, you spend a lot of time in the woods. I mean, you live in the woods. You built a cabin. You actually, again, going back to that shelter, you live in a shelter for a long time. There you go. There's your backyard. Good oh, Lord. I, I, I should have married <laughs> you when I had the chance. <laughs> but but the, the, you think about it though is, is um is what you're talking about do you go to wilderness for solace to escape from all that because like, it's it it sounds like a, a glamorous life but but it can't be at one, one point you go to a bar and you, you're playing tunes you don't want to play uh people are asking you to play your own stuff do you go into the woods to escape all that to rethink and then come back and and kind of be re-energized or um Hmm. I, that definitely helps for sure. But, uh, <laughs> the woods to me is like, even if I wasn't doing music, say I would still be doing, I'd still be living this way. I'm pretty much guaranteed. Like, uh, there's, I, I love solitude like this. Um, I'm at my best usually if there's let like not a much distraction around and there's, it's quiet and, uh, you're close to nature. Like that's when I feel great, no matter what I'm doing or where I am. Like, um, that's, that's like baseline for me. Like I, I love being in that kind of setting. So, uh, um, yeah, being out in nature, especially like really wild nature, uh, where there's no development, no people, just you and the animals. Uh, I think I really, you, like everybody gets in touch with, uh, a very human side of ourselves that's buried in a city, like in the city, I think, uh, you know, to quote a very famous David Suzuki thing, but I think it's true. I think we suffer from a loss of place in a city. You know, we, we don't really belong there biologically. Like, uh, I think, I think we're kind of like estranged in a city and to cope with it, we have a bajillion, you know, distractions like cell phones and fancy things and TVs and everything, you name it, you can have it in the city. And I love going to cities for a while, but it drains me eventually. Um, I prefer, I prefer being too close to the simple truths of life, as I call them. Uh, it just keeps me grounded and keeps me happy. So, yeah.
fantastic. I, and I just have this random thing too. Um, are you able just to play a bit of Untamed? Oh yeah, sure. I haven't played that one in a while. Uh oh. I was too used to playing uh, every other song that I've never written that I haven't oh. written. Uh, oh, at Bohemian <laughs> <Even> Rhapsody. <laughs> I can, of, of course, I can play either one of those. Uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'll try a little bit of Untamed here. Uh, this was definitely inspired by being awarded and living on the water all the time. That's where this came from. Um, uh, yeah, on the west side of Algonquin Park. Um, now, forgive me, I haven't sang it in quite a while, but I'll do a little bit of it for you. Let's see how we do here. All day long on these waters, in what so many have seen, was it her money love so the lover? And in the place of plenty, unnamed, unchanged, unchanged, the land of renamed, renamed, reclaimed, champagne, and it's fantastic. That's fantastic. I love that song. It's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, so, so basically what, what's next is that you're going to another park maybe because you need a job and you want to be in the woods and you need more material. Uh, in your head um, is spinning around East Coast stuff uh, and um, um, you want to write that stuff. You're still living in the cabin uh, and going back to one thing I didn't really talk too much about is that shelter. You, you ba how long did you live? Like for six months you lived in a, like a stick house. Not even a house. It was a, it was a cave. The proper term is debris hut, Kevin. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> yes, a, a stick house debris hut thing, yeah. Um, which uh, was more like a fort, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but um, yeah, so a couple years back, um, my other big passion in life had been uh, outdoor stuff, you know. So after music school, I decided to do this apprenticeship uh, with this uh, group called Sixth and Stones Wilderness School, and I believe they're still doing it. Um, but anyways, uh, you had to go live out on their property for eight months, uh, like in a tent or in a shelter you built yourself, and then take the courses that they offer in primitive skills. So I spent two or three months in my tent, and then I built my shelter, and I was in there for another six months or so. And uh, yeah, it was just made out of sticks and leaves and uh, grass and whatever whatever debris you find on the forest floor. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was amazing. It was a great experience. Um, that's probably the reason why I'm here in this cabin right now <laughs> was because I did that, because it gave me the confidence to do something like this. And uh, yeah, it was incredible. I mean, I'm not going to pursue like, well, that's a different story. I, I should say like um, music still my main path in life, music and art and all that. Um, that was just a great experience to kind of, give me a deeper understanding of the natural world and kind of push myself and, and develop an appreciation for, for old skills, which is really, it was really a cultural experiment too, because I mean, that's what Canada was for the longest time was living very simply close to the land. Uh, so anyways, doing that was amazing. Uh, I had some blankets in there and I had, you know, like my sleeping bag in there and a couple of things I noticed living in my debris hut was uh, you sleep, amazingly well um crazy vivid dreams all the time um very deep sleeps uh animals get way closer to you so if you're in a big orange tent you know it's kind of like a beacon saying i'm here but if you're in a debris hut like deer would come right past me right outside the debris hut sometimes and an owl actually a great horned owl landed right on the top right over top of my debris hut and hooted really loud woke me up in the night and it like I could feel the vibrations of its vocals like in my like in my body. Like it was right there, so loud. And I mean, if I was in a tent, it probably wouldn't have got that close. I doubt it. Another big thing living that way is it gives you a lot of resiliency. 
So it makes you, you know, when you're used to living just in the actual bare bones, uh, once you have something that's more than that, it's like the best thing in the world, you know? So like I live off grid right now, I've got some solar power, I've got running water, which is like amazing. Anyone who takes running water for granted, like <laughs> try going without it for a day. <laughs> Or in my case, I haven't had running water in ages here, and I finally got it back. And this cabin's a whole other story. But um, anyways, resiliency. So like now that I have power running water here and like some of each, not unlimited like you get in the city, it feels so satisfying uh, that I can't even describe it. And living in the shelter played into that too because I was I had like nothing out there, you know, just what I brought in. You know, my day-to-day -day was with very little. And once you learn to live that way, um, yeah, it just makes you a much stronger person, I found. Yeah, that, that album, uh, Cabin, uh, Cabin, uh, is it Cabin Speak? Mm -hmm. Cabin mm -hmm. something. Is it Cabin Speak? That is it. Uh, do you have anything from there that you would want to sing? Um, sure, yeah. I actually got, I, I took uh, Northwest and Cabin Speak offline, believe it or not. I'm redoing, um, yeah, so really? looking ahead. I'm trying to get like one big album like across the country. So I'm going to take my favorite songs from there, redo them, add a bunch of new ones in and then put out like a mainland kind of tribute to across the country. And then I'm going to have my Newfoundland album that I want to put together as well. So there are two things that I'm working on right now. Yeah. But there, this one I'm keeping from uh, Captain Speak. Um, and it's actually a tune from based on around here. Uh, the Algonquin Park area and actually the Ottawa Valley as well. Uh, a place where you drive along the highway and you see those old dilapidated barns falling apart, the old log buildings. Um, and uh, I actually met uh, one of those people. Um, he was getting rid of one of those places and he was really sad about it, but he had to do it because what else is he going to do with it, you know? Um, and uh, so this is kind of his story about uh, leaving the house that he grew up in and you know having it torn down and moved away um and actually in my cabin here i have a bunch of the old boards around from that cabin from it from that old house which is pretty pretty cool but uh anyways this is called uh, time to leave the homestead yeah. Standing alone in his kingdom come, he gazes into the rolling valley hills. Memories of being on the farm come to him as a light face the thrills. Try to let it go. No. The old log home, he'd always know, leaves and sags in its tears alone. And all the parts that begin to fall, let him know he's got a big part. That's great. That's great. I I really like that 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 song from the album. The um, it's really it's really cool listening to your stuff because I've been listening to your stuff for a long, long time. And uh, yeah, we met at the we did the what's it called? What's it called? What's it called? Um, oh my TEDx. gosh, we all spoke in Algonquin at the TEDx. 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 Yeah, the yes. TEDx. Yeah, and I remember being in the audience and I was like, "Who is this guy?" Like, and I think you did in, in, instrumentals at the time. You weren't singing at that point. You're just doing that. Mm -hmm. My Lord, that's, that's a long time. Yeah, that was a while ago. It was a while ago. 2012, I think it was, eight years ago. Oh, man. <laughs> Going so, on eight years. Uh, if you look at it, here we are, uh, you know, from there, you uh, you created four albums. Uh, you're now singing and supposed to just playing. You uh, you graduated from the university with uh, honors in, in instrumental stuff. And then you said, well, you know, that's kind of silly. I'm, I'm going to start singing now. And then you started 
having a love affair with Stan Rogers, um, love Canadians, um, that sort of thing. Where do you see, um, actually, you know what? I hate this question when it's asked to me, but, 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 but basically, where do you see uh, like in 10 years from now? Do you, do you sort, I, I don't think you're the type of person that has a plan. <laughs> Nailed it, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, there's a couple things I know for sure. One is that I'm kind of a nonconformist. I mean, like I live off grid, you know, <laughs> like, like uh, so the whole idea of like A plus B equals C career, you know, all that, like, I don't really follow that exact uh, roadmap. Um, but that's not to say I don't work hard. Like I work nonstop and I have a lot of like, uh, musically, I have all kinds of goals and I'm always pushing myself. Um, so I know that that's what I'm going to be doing for the next, as far as I know, the next 10 years is just working on music, working on music, working on music. And whatever that turns into, it'll turn into. But um, I don't want to go the other way around where I don't want to market myself like crazy and then have to catch up with this thing that I've created. You, you know what I mean? Uh, I want it to happen on its own. I'm, I'm still going to record, like I still have plans to record and do all kinds of videos and like I have for plans for all that. But when you put it into the context of a business plan, you lose me on that. I mean, the main thing for me is that I just keep getting better and better and better each album I put out. That's the main thing. And the other main thing is that um, I keep doing it. And uh, yeah, uh, and then whatever happens from there in the you know business world or economy or whatever, well, that will, we'll see what happens, I guess. Yeah. But, but uh, I, when I start thinking that way, it just drains me, and I'm like, eh. yeah. <laughs> does that does that frustrate uh, you at times, though? I mean, you think about it. Um, I I actually interviewed um, a couple of really famous musicians uh, this week, and um, one knew of you, and um, but I was actually sort of pissed they didn't know about you, and. Um, I was, I'm thinking, you don't know this guy? And is it because you live in a cabin in the woods? I mean, the other musicians don't. They, they are connected to the marketing, the media. Um, they, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say any of them play the game, um, but, but you know, they, they, they have seen the game, right? So does that, you know, should you just escape and then live in Toronto in a, in a condo and maybe you would become a fam famous musician or what? Um, <laughs> that's certainly an option like I uh, I that yeah that's the kind of world I actually I don't want to get caught up in um prematurely anyways like I say I'm going to keep putting out albums uh keep upping the bar for myself and I believe in time that stuff will just speak for itself I'm going to keep doing my own like promoting on my own scale my own level but to actually up and move to Nashville I think that's I think that's unnecessary. <laughs> like, um, that's just not me. I think, uh, first of all, I like it out here and I, I like Canada. So I don't want to like go move to LA just to be famous. If you, if you're in anything just to get fame, uh, I hate to be blunt, but I think there's something wrong with you. <laughs> like, you know, um, I, if you want attention that bad, like, I don't know, man. I mean, I like attention when it's warranted. Sure, like if someone's going to say, you did a great job, well, thanks. But if I want fame for fame's sake, uh, I think that's a very slippery slope. And then once you're at the top of the mountain, the only place to go is down. And we've seen that enough times in, in society, haven't we? <laughs> so uh, I, I don't want to go down that road. What's the most important thing for me is quality. And if it's quality for me in my cabin, going out into the internet, or quality for me in St. John's, I was in St. John's, Newfoundland all winter, which is a city, smaller city, but nonetheless, um, that's the main thing. It doesn't matter where I am, it's the quality of the work. I, I could care less about all the other stuff, really. So, uh, but uh, even St. John's, like I love St. John's, but you're still in the city and you're part of this, like, um, you're part of this, you're part of the scene all of a sudden and you're a player in the scene and then it becomes something else. Like you lose the, you lose kind of the purity of the craft in it. And 
you can especially see it in big cities. Like I'm sure I've never really been to LA or spent a whole lot of time in New York, but you know, in Toronto and things like that in big cities, the music scene tends to get very superficial and people are in it for the wrong reasons, just to get attention, just to get famous, just to get money. Um, and they're in it um, for egotistical reasons. And if I were to join into something like that, uh, that would just kind of, that's just not my scene. <laughs> like, um, I'd rather, uh, a good, a great Newfoundland song puts it this way. Um, the middle of nowhere is where I likes it best. <laughs> and that is very true for me. That's the way it is. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's a really good way to end this whole thing because, um, <laughs> you actually made my day. Well, we're going to finish it off with a song, I think. And, uh, it's not Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, yeah, you asked that. <laughs> what would you like to finish off with? Oh man, um, what am I going to finish off with now? Uh, let's see here. Yukon Gold was a great finisher idea. Uh, you got oh, me there. Because it was yeah. a whiskey chat. You see, this is how I wrote it down, but it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. See, I have a bunch of songs in the works that. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let me think here. I'll get one. I'll get one. Um, well, since we've laughed a lot about Newfoundland, I haven't played a song from there yet, so maybe I'll play one from there. Ah. I think it's a good idea. I played a few of my own, so yeah, I'll play. This is a, um, and I'll introduce listeners to what a musician from Newfoundland referred to as a holy song from Newfoundland um, called uh, Joe Bat's Arm Long Liners, uh, which is unknown to a lot of people on mainland Canada. Um, but out there, it's really in everybody's heart, this song. And I think it's a beautiful song. And um, it's, uh, you know, it just talks about people and their relationship to the sea. And it's just a beautiful song. So I'll play a little bit of that and maybe we'll end there. All right. As you approach that busy scene, you'll see some fishermen. Girls are all excited, the long liners coming in. Oh, there's the Gilbert and the Stella, she's loaded down with game. Justin and the Endeavor. Billy Burke is made with their hearty crews of captains. They're the finest fishermen. The girls are all excited. The long liners coming in. Oh, for the Joe Bats are long liners. They're coming home tonight. And as they steam up the harbor, you can see their massive light. With their hearty crews and captains, they're the finest fishermen. The girls are all excited, the long lighters coming in. Yeah, Joe Bat's arm long liners. <laughs> Great song. That's fantastic. Wow, wow. Well, cheers to you, my friend. Right back at you. Cheers. I still want to know where you got that shirt, but. <laughs> That's, uh, it's between me and the cabin. <laughs> but, um, yes, me and the shirt uh, and the cabin say thanks for having me. This was really great to talk to you. That was great. It was a great conversation. Uh, yeah. Cheers to the fireside chat and good luck to your isolation. That you've been uh, yes. for a long, long time before this whole pandemic. <laughs> Same to you. Enjoy.
It was early in the spring when I decided to go for to work up in the woods in North Ontario. When the unemployment office said they sent me through to the little epitome with the survey crew. The black fly, the little black fly, always a black fly, no matter where I go I'll die. With the black fly picking my bones in North Ontario, I owe in North Ontario. Now the man back told me was the captain of the crew and he said I'm gonna tell you boys what we're gonna do. They want to build a power dam, we must find a way for to make the little lab go around the other way. With the black fly, the little black Always a black fly, no matter where you go, I'll die with a black fly picking my balls in North Ontario, Ohio, North Ontario. Well, we serve it to the east, then we serve it to the west, and we couldn't make our minds up how to do it best. They laugh, they laugh, what shall I do for a mob of gold crazy and the survey crew? With the black fly, the little black fly, always a black fly, no matter where you go, I'll die with a black fly picking my balls in North Ontario, Ohio. There's black fly, black fly everywhere, crawling in your whiskers, crawling in your hair. Swimming in the soup and swimming in the T.O. Devil take the black fly, let me be with the black fly, with the little black fly. Always a black fly, no matter where you go, I'll die with the black fly, picking my bones in North Ontario. Black told me to the swear because the work went slow. The state of our morale was getting pretty low. The flies weren't heavy, it was hard to get your breath. I just stayed up and down the trail, talking to yourself with the black fly, with the little black fly. Always a black fly, no matter where you go, I'll die with the black fly. Picking my bones in North Ontario, I owe North Ontario. The bull cook's name was Blind River Joe. If I hadn't been for him, it'd never pull through. He bound up our and he kept us for fun and loud. This some draw some gum with the black fly, the little black fly. Oh, with a black fly, no matter where you go, I'll die with a black fly picking my bones in North Ontario, Ohio, North Ontario. And at last the job was over, Black Toby said we're through with our little Abitibi and survey crew. It was a wonderful experience, but this I know. I'll never go again to North Ontario With a black fly, a little black fly oh, With a black fly, no matter where I go, I'll die With a black fly, picking my bones in North Ontario I oh, North Ontario